Hello everyone, today we talk about a Byzantine military unit named Trapezitai that we can date somewhere between the 7th and the 10th century. Um, of course, here it's not much about the specialty that exists at this point because we're essentially talking about light cavalry of native troops right from within the empire, something different from the auxiliaries uh, from the steps, etc. And we will refer to it uh, in a moment before passing to it. So a type of unit that you could have found really throughout all the time. I, I already made actually a video about um, late Roman light cavalry and it was a pretty generic video in a way. Uh, and so this is in part its continuation um, with some peculiar characteristics differences however for the between the aforementioned troops and the trapezitae specifically. Uh, first of all, a bit of etymology. We do not know exactly what trapezitae really means, right? At least we know what the, the etymology uh, stems from linguistically, but we do not understand why the unit were, were, uh, was called like this. Um, so as we will realize now, these are uh, light cavalry men of sort. There were heavier troops within them as well. Uh, especially among the, the officers, so it's not much about the troop um, as a wall, right? But we see this term in, in the middle Byzantine period, primarily the 9th, 10th century, we'll see the, uh, the specific sources now. And um, these units were re renowned for their skills as essentially missile cavalry, mostly javeliners. There were some archers among them, but it was not their primary deal. Uh, recently made a video about um, Byzantine warfare in general, starting actually from the 11th uh, century um, onwards, in which we explain how it's not until Manzikert, really, that horse archery becomes prominent, and especially because of foreign troops. Uh, so as light mounted uh, a light horseman uh, in the same Byzantine army that became ever say stronger in core as far as the maintain the subtle troops right as heavy professionals um, and relying ever more on these foreigners at this point in history instead the Byzantine mm, military machine was still uh, on its feet in spite of the pretty heavy blow suffered uh, in the early Middle Ages, when, as you know, the size of the empire was half and basically by, uh, mostly by the Islamic invasions, but not only just yesterday, I was making a video about different populations that, in fact, were just uh, waiting like vultures outside, you know, uh, the Byzantine boundaries, or uh, already in earlier times. Um, but um, the trapezite fit... Uh, this um, mounted, say that this migration year, late antique legacy of the Byzantine army, as far as especially the nurturing of significantly trained native troops, that at this point in history, later on in the High Middle Ages, had again pa been passing through the same filter of this dramatic shrinking of the empire that had lost naturally also a lot of manpower and so had to rely ever more, even though we have very few uh, sources about the period and about the Byzantine army in general at that point. Um, so making the best possible use of the uh, records available. This was again already a late antique thing, as you know, the training of the uh, Roman troops on average increased even uh, in late Roman times. It may seem strange, but let's say um, the, also the light forces as the heavy ones were trained to perform really different tactical roles supporting each other in a very dynamic way, etc. And especially light cavalry had to be that skilled um, in many ways. And horse archery had been existing. Uh, there had been Hunnic mercenaries, Turkic mercenaries of other kind later on. Uh, and I made a video about um, this kind of guys in the early Middle Ages from the 6th to the 10th century. I made a video on the heavy and the light Asiatic cavalrymen in a very generic sense. You can argue that uh, the military style of the latter had never really changed uh, throughout the ages. There are different peoples that can fit sort of the standard pack, especially in the of equipment, of, um, of armament, 
as far as the lighter and in fact way more uh, abundant proportionally uh, type of cavalry w was concerned that the Byzantines could cheaply hire from just their Pontic um, Balkan uh, position but also from the Caucasus uh, etc. So it, I already made some videos trying to make ethnic distinctions in, as within the Byzantine uh, auxiliary units they're especially based on their provenance I also made a series about Eurasian steppes warfare that deals a bit with this, but um, most of the differences, in fact, were in the heavy panoplies that we can, in fact, obviously document archaeologically because the lighter ones that were almost non existing, at least to, to make a significant difference or to evolve um, in peculiar ways. Um, so, this, um, the Light cavalry forces of, of, of the empires, such as native national ones, if you want to call them, were truly essential uh, for, for the, the Byzantine army. Right? They contributed significantly to the tactical capability and effectiveness of the imperial forces. The term trapezitae, again, does not refer to the soldiers either um, recruited in any particular part of the empire. Some people could be confused, say, but this guy maybe came from Trapezos. Trapezos. No, no, it has not to do with that. It's actually a generic term used to describe this type, was described now from the armament of light cavalry uh, during this period. They were versatile mounted troops that excelled in skirmishing and hit and run tactics. Uh, they were typically armed with missiles, again, prevalently javelins, but also bows, and they were skilled in this kind of um, specific uh, of specialty. Uh, so, needless to say, they played a crucial role in reconnaissance, raiding, harassing enemy forces, and very often think about this against enemies that were not. Uh, from their sedentary background, yet nomadic, so literally the best uh, for you know that kind of tactics and uh, say specialization, and that yet in turn these imperial troops were specifically trained to cope um, with. Um, they weren't the only ones, but they still constitute a, a, a massive chunk of the same. Naturally, there were some nomads that actually became trapezitae, as we can think to some reason. It wasn't that uh, much of a rigidity in terms of wherever you came from. So, of course, um, the Byzantines had been influenced by that kind of warfare, but still, the fact that javelins um, seemed to prevail, right? In the, we, we realized that over horse archery, and of course, also those steps people who had a lot of... Um, Javelin warfare, telling the truth, that's something we tend to, to forget often, especially before the further waves of um, of peoples from the, the bowels of, of Asia that in that sense were ever lighter in the average, sort of, in sent that there was, especially around this time, and I made a video about especially the Khazars for rear Asian steps warfare, there had been a gradual um, sort of sanitarization of same step warfare to some degree, so that you see actually horse archery declining a little bit. And after all, this bigger movement of people with the migration in your head somehow stopped after the the first big, um, let's say, Turkic kind of um, uh, empires had somehow collapsed. So we will see this better in some other video. I made videos about the August Turks as well, uh, but we will come back um, on the same topic. In any case, Constantinople had been coping also and consistently with sanitary foes, right? the Arabs, uh, other, like the Westerners um, as well. So a light cavalryman in the guise of a javeliner was really useful in many ways. And these guys had an interesting type of equipment that suggests they were, these weren't just cheap throwaway sort of light cavalry force. Of course, their tactical role was mostly that, because otherwise, they would, by definition, they would have not been light cavalry that, as you know, in a, um, a strategically cultured way is not how much, you know, um, uh, you put on a scale in terms of weight of equipment. It's literally, you know, in comparison to the tactical specialty of the heavier and the light troops in function to one another, the light troops do not hold 
ground against the heavier ones, and that's what discriminates them fundamentally. But again, and we know that these centuries were about a lot of frontier warfare, guerrillas, and sort of even strategically inconclusive uh, campaigns, because uh, the just the manpower was limited, so there weren't major... Uh, there were actually large, of course, um, expeditions, even important territorial reconquest from the side of the empire, but generally speaking, the, the average guy would have been employed in, in this frontier scenarios with uh, a lot of care for this um, raids, hit and run tactics and strategies, right, at the same time. Um, which is even, I don't know, on, on the Bulgarian frontier, let's say. That's the idea, but even in Anatolia, right? Um, so the etymology is not entirely clear, as we understand. The most accepted scholarly explanation is that the term derives from the Greek trapeza, which means table, right? And this name was likely given due to the sort of squared rhomboid shapes that these guys could um, give to the formations, given the, the various drills. Um, I also made a, a bit about Byzantine battle formations. And, you know, there is a bit of sort of Hellenic-minded geometrism about this. There were all these tactical modules that these guys were, however, really trained to um, to be able to, to, to replicate operationally. And uh, that may have not done something with that, but we're not sure. Um, table could be also a reference to the craft that um, uh, certain sort of bankers or, or people working in the supply system of the army um, could have could have used, from which the trapezita in this sense would have been drawn from uh, as non-full so sort of heavy combatants, but guys that could provide this uh, at least. Um, light, in fact, forces, but with still some degree of um, of equipment, of training, due to their organizational background. We just don't know, and likely it's not even that important um, after all, because it's how these guys were, were employed that really uh, had, uh, had a purpose. Um, so, already around this time, Light cavalry were usually drawn from barbarian auxiliaries. And the typology there was uh, starting to see the prevalence of horse archery and or a consistent amount uh, of that, right? Um, the Byzantines definitely employed very different and large, um, really large numbers of auxiliary light cavalry throughout all this entire period um, until by uh, Nikephorian times, right? The trapezita do not stand out just like the Nikephorian cataphracts, right? But um, the, the let's say even before man's occurred, there was uh, a sensible increase of um, uh, allied horse archers as uh, light cavalrymen, right? Because society was starting to be shattered to the point that sort of the Byzantine peasant soldier was not sort of the um, more reliable thing the empire could rely on in terms of recruits, and so models were really changing. Um, consider even the, pover the material poverty of the times, right? Having lighter troops even just for, especially in this sort of eastern scenario that is so influenced by um, in fact, lighter, uh, mostly nomadic forces, but not only is um, is, is more it is definitely a more marked characteristic than say uh, simply in the West. It was already becoming bulkier, right? Especially through Carolingian times, but already given the di different distribution in in wealth um, and um, the the average sort of ten, twelve century. Uh, guy is more documentable than the one of this uh, early high tape early and later medieval times from Byzantine iconography right at that time it was rather the, the Pachinex Patsinax that had 
fact taken place and um, this guys could be uh, influenced of course in outlook by by different military cultures including uh, the Arabs for example and the top coat split for riding was quite um, uh, quite uh, widespread right but also baggy shirts flowing trousers right when you look even at uh, Khazar scenario of these entries uh, that's what you can can imagine uh, these were however immediately recognized but also for other reasons right Khazars had um, long flowing hair they some were described as both reddish um, and black um, in, in color interestingly enough um, uh, the guys were apparently dark at least according to Byzantine sources uh, in skin but there were interesting equipments as well sabers right composite bows um, with um, carried even in multiple numbers especially the latter quivers were contained up to 60 arrows but more typically uh, holding 24 30 right um, consider even the expenses in the steps for the huge amount of arrows that were normally shot um, on a regular basis these guys uh, built by themselves um, this also brought to a limited uh, penetration uh, this arrows tended to be light right um, there were for this reason also light hollow javelins uh, suspends from the saddle for example lassos right to entangle enemy riders and horses in close combat but more typically in the pursuit phase given that these lighter uh, troops were used mostly also just to chase the enemy afterwards to lay waste to, to loot whatever um, consider that there are different influences here from the Magyars the Pachinics, um with that for example, typically carried axes. Um, most of these um, Eurasian um, horsemen carried small circular shields of leather into Rowan osiers, and um, they had been there for centuries and centuries. So the Byzantines were already and uh, surely mm, equipping, training their troops in a way that at least was functional to cope against this sort of typical uh, and perennial um, enemy, say average enemy, th in uh, at least certain uh, frontiers. And consider here the Byzantine mentality also that we get from the treaties of Strategicon of Leo the Sixth, um, the latter referring to the Trapezitae, by the way, uh, and um, reflecting this sort of in altered like perfect world that had been sanctioned by the new Rome right the idea that the world had basically to look like what the Byzantines had classified it like right and it didn't have much to change of course in these centuries if you had seen how gradual the growth uh, of the world was you would have even just just thought that yes it seems like as if the universe had always remained the same um, but of course uh, armies never stayed quite the same and things always change politically uh, and socially right um, so there were in these from the 7th to the 10th century a few Byzantine horse archers uh, even non-existing by the end of this period meaning that with the decline of the native forces also the capacity to train them with uh, with bow on horseback and I made a video about the specific archery training that Byzantines um, issued in the 6th century for their military uh, and so that had been a thing really in, in a time that had been of course difficult not as difficult as the later one but still that uh, in fact had um, so resources to train them for this way and at, at this point in history even in the toughest times uh, say the seventh century the Byzantines had of course carried on with that legacy also because as we said before they settled horse archers themselves that would become Byzantine subjects but again towards the end of this period today's video period 
uh, decrisis of the Byzantine peasantry somehow brought an end to even this um, philosophy of sophisticated training for every single native unit, especially when the empire was sort of enlarging, sort of becoming more oligarchic, troops were more um, readily available, uh, more professional, there there was simply more money around to, say, avoid the sort of territorial uh, burden and just to hire whatever they, they found. So, while paradoxically horse archery was to increase later on, um, this was not the case from within the native troops, right? And so, still, and and even more towards the end of of, of this period, you have more trapezite than than ever. Another name used for this light cavalry, for some reason, was monozonai, which actually have a, uh, is a term used for a, a more complex variety of troops in the Byzantine army. Right, this term comes from the Greek mono meaning single, or only in zone meaning band or girdle, and so it can be translated as those who wear a single band or those who wear a single belt. Um, and these were had been at least important troops, especially in the earlier times. Um, they had even been part of some elite force um, for the distinctive equipment and the meaning of the term would stem from the fact that they would have had um, a single white belt over their armor which served to protect their waist and abdomen. Um, so the belt was known as the monozone and this, these guys were called like this. They were also in the Imperial Guard, etc. So it has nothing to do with the term how it's used instead for these other centuries. Uh, it seems that there was a Slavic influence in this uh, sort of uh, belt, right? Uh, we um, get, especially from the time of Justinian the second, we're at the end of the 7th, beginning of the 8th century, um, uh, the integration of, well, probably the, the recognition of a status of the Monozone within the Byzantine uh, army, but we do not know uh, more than much, and uh, in general just this was the term that we understand was applied to instead this sort of uh, lighter native light cavalry in the, in the Byzantine army for how it had come to be across this the Saint. Uh, and these guys were quite skilled uh, uh, in um, in everything concerning uh, just light uh, cavalry tactics, but trick riding, that is to say the actor performing stunts while horseba- uh, horseback riding, um, which also gave the name to our modern circus term, right? Uh, given that that was one of the uh, fact feats that had to, to carry out, right, in this maneuvering had to be as fluid as orderly though, because the Byzantines cared very much about this almost Eumenian idea of, you know, internal lines, order, um, the capacity, as we've seen, of replicating the exact formations. Especially for lighter cavalry, this was um, at least a a very important training part, because even though normally uh, light troops uh, operate in open order, and even without a particular type of geometric uh, formation, um, they were in fact not just about this, right? And their role as light troops still entailed some important offensive capacities, even in closer combat, as we will see now. Um, The closest type of unit having existed connected with the trapezitae in tactical functionality were the late Roman scutari, right? They may have even been their direct descendants uh, to some degree, right? The scutari were uh, just a a particular type of troop that uh, we we don't have time to simply digress on, but they had, say, formed... um, so in this case, even some elite units, right? At Adrianople, for example, they had been fighting in close um, cooperation with the horse archers uh, of the Sagittari, as they were termed. Um, the Scutari could be both cavalry and, and infantry. They, they seemed to, at that point to have been heavy. So, of course, the, uh, the concept had evolved over time. Um, the um, 
uh, the, the say some of their function had evolved even on the base of their offensive weapons, not much of the scutum, right? Um, in fact, the scutatus main weapon was the 12 to 14 foot contarian. So a spear, something between 3.6 and 4.2 um, meters long. Um, and the this uh, native um, troops had uh, eventually passed to uh, acquire different roles depending on the strategical and tactical needs of the arm. The trapezitae are described for our time period by both Leo the Sixth um, the oath and the author of the Syllogia Tacticorum. You know that Leo fundamentally repeats the strategic and adds something typical of the era. Well, the, the trapezitae were part of this, so they are relevant um, enough for, of course, even the emperor um, to care. Uh, and so they weren't simply light cavalry as the cheap throwaway one, but were something sort of more refined, part of these. Um, again, quite um, intense Byzantine uh, uh, synergic um, tactics, right, between the various arms, um, and they were essential, of course, to the um, success of the heavier troops. We think the trapezitae to have been fundamentally unarmored, albeit some may wear a hood of horn scales. Male corselets were used by some as well, so they were not entirely unarmored units as such. There was some heavier element that had to sort of lead the rest, right? Um, we see, of course, helmets uh, of crested iron type, let's say. Um, the, um, the, the horn thing is uh, also typical of some, even wood, right, if you look at Belisarius expeditions, you see, you see that the, the, the early medieval material poverty brought uh, troops of even some weight, let's say, to, to use plank of woods in the lack of metal, that the, the Byzantines didn't even have too much, like, didn't have many metal mines in the empire at this point, so everything would do, really. But uh, when things began to improve, you could see more frequently light male corselets that were something really the same steps had uh, western Eurasian steps had been gradually adopting from uh, the heavier uh, sanitary Europe which is sort of ironic because it does seem that male was um, was a step in invention but let's say the as it often happens, right? That's not necessarily uh, the the place of creation that has to eventually bring to the uh, more widespread adoption of the same. If anything, because the steps are have also dramatically impoverished themselves during the migration era, right? It was not a party for the invaders, really, uh, and um, it's rather that aforementioned process of sedentarization of Western Eurasian steps uh, due to a moment of calm in this later centuries that brings um, the heavier models from sanitary Europe to, to, to spread further. This is evident, as I was saying before, among the Khazars, etc. And the Byzantines themselves, of course, and especially for these troops, would have in part uh, been influenced, even though, of course, they had always had male armor and just, let's say, um, their iconography shows us more lamellar stuff for some... Um, artistic purpose, but we do know archaeologically that male was um, sort of more common than at least what the iconography shows. Um, the rest of the equipment, again, many trapezitae were unarmored, right? So what would just be out there was the tunic, red or blue, typically, um, during this era. It was a minimal standard of uniformation, even. Uh, in early medieval times uh, that, uh, of course, had to do with the usual means of recognition, of tactical, uh, say, uh, say the sort of dynamic uh, tactics that would say, who's that guy running there? Or what's that unit even on the field? So everything had to be recognizable and there was some sort of um, ethos attached to the same symbolism uh, of the caller. 
the Contarian, as we've seen, was uh, the, the major weapon that had been inherited from uh, the um, Scutari times. Two or three javelins. A sword, this is what the sources uh, we mentioned before really tell us, so a, essentially a medium light cavalry, right, of some sort, right? Um, light enough to be agile, but also being equipped in a, in a way that mirrors uh, substantial combativeness. The um, javelins were not apparently exceeding 2.7 uh, meters in length, which means that these missiles would have been relatively close range ones, right? They weren't that light, and they were uh, thus uh, indicating that the trapezitae were, of course, taking on enemies at substantially close range, hence also the, um, the sword that it's not just a dagger or, or a knife, right? Like a, a step um, light cavalryman would have normally had. As we've seen, the Contarian II was a sizable weapon uh, inherited from previous times for even a substantial shock capacity. It's still light cavalry. Don't, don't, um, let's not exaggerate entirely. But let's say it's multitask um, capacity, especially against enemies that on average, are uh, even poorer than the early medieval average, the, the step ones, and or peoples living at the outskirts of Constantinople not being, of course, more affluent than them think about the Balkan frontier. The same Anatolian world, Calgasus, etc. Yes, it had, especially the latter, some feudal character, but it was definitely not more, a more prosperous place than the Byzantine Empire. So um, the average enemy from there would have been sort of lighter, and this means that in relative terms, as we said before, this lighter uh, horsemen were somehow heavier for the opponents at the time. Uh, the shield is also an interesting thing. It could either be the 90 centimeters in diameter, Thureos, or the oval infantry Scuta. This is interesting because as you know, in, in the ancient world, the Thurios was the oval uh, shield, whereas the the infantry scutum, from which the Greek term scuta here derived, was also oval. But uh, the Thurios at this point had become circular, rather, right? And 90 centimeters is not that few. It's the still the, the reason why it's called Thurios etymologically. Um, yeah, uh, etymologically in this case, was, was, was that the same terminology was applied to it is that it, it was meant to be quite um, covering as a real, uh, not enveloping like this, the school that, that still maintained part of the concave shape, but rather like a, as a surface or a real deflector of blows, which of course for a light infantryman, um, especially against such ferocious step foes that as we've seen through a lot of uh, darts, light ones, but still if you're a light infantryman you, you have to be aware of that. Uh, there was some kind of padded armor surely used by the Strapezita as well. can be very very useful. However, there were also smaller shields. Um, one type of 30 centimeters in diameter, another of uh, almost 70 that are, uh, say, to be found in the sources. So of course, the these say uh, there wasn't a full standardization of the equipment of shields, etc. The, 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 the shapes are historically pretty much the same, either circular or oval. Uh, of course, the uh, heavier, lighter shield depended on what kind of tactical role you had to perform. Right, the heavier the shield, the greater the fatigue. But thus, the slower the trooper, but also greater the protection. Uh, conversely, for the smaller shields, of course, you would be speeder because they had less impediment, but also less protection. And, and there it was up to you and sort of the, the, the unit, the commanders, even the material availability, you had to uh, just decide, uh, depending on the enemy, what kind of choice you had to, uh, to make. Right, let's consider that horse 
uh, archers from the steppes were typically equipped with a very small shield because they were used to just defend uh, themselves by carrying out uh, suppression fire against the enemy so if you can carry out that successfully that's going to be your best protection because there's there's not going to be as too many arrows flying at you back um, and so this could indicate that still of course within the trapezita there were significant differences in sort of missile capacity probably also horse archer in a consistent fashion um, at other times it may have just been a matter of I don't know I just have this shield Right, or I don't have a much better equipment in the first place. The Imperial arsenals had their supplies, uh, there was some degree of uh, centralized uh, arms and armor production, mostly in Constantinople and tendentially ever more so. The, the provinces were becoming ever less reliable, but in part also because they had their autonomous military capabilities. So you can imagine all the degree of influences also from different peoples, from the, just the, the general political and social situation of the province right would they be uh, at war even for a for a longer uh, or, or, or a shorter time right how how much did peace last in some areas there were some local reforms due to the the way say these provinces were particularly administered um, but uh, the essentials right of warfare were also pretty much the same Circular shields continued to predominate amongst the Imperial Light Cavalry. Even after, we have seen it recently, the kite-shaped shield was in widespread use, uh, and not just in the sort of bigger type, but also in, in the smaller ones. Yes, there were tiny kite shields used also by lighter troops, not just the one in covering her. And of course, of course, those were less um, relevant, but that's exactly the point. It was mostly the circular shield that remained around. Um, as we were saying before, the sources describing this are Leo and the Syllogy. This type of cavalryman altogether does not appear in the Strategicon. However, it seems reasonable to assume that such troops were had been present from ever, right? And and so even when we look at, and especially I would say, when we look at Byzantine manuals, we have always to bear in mind that we're quite, especially at this point, stylistic sort of um, uh, worldviews, uh, even about uh, their own armies, all these, again, different tactical modules to replicate against this or that enemy. Well, Yes, tendentially there was a direction, but of course every battle, uh, every commander, every formation, was, every unit was different, every soldier was different, uh, and we know pretty certainly that lighter troops equipped with uh, this, this decent um, armament, actually, um, had always been around, right? So the main characteristic of the trapezitae being, at the end of the day, this substantial protection in the guise of the shield, mostly 90 centimeters in di diameter. An important offensive capacity with two or three javelins that are somehow standard, but also, you know, that, that are long uh, enough um, to actually constitute a, a more serious we weapon at close range rather than a, a longer one. Considering that, of course, uh, the enemies of the empire were quite different from one another, there was a lot of archery within the same Byzantine army, but we can't say that um, fighting with javelins at closer range is sometimes more, it's sometimes easier, and this can kind of betrays also the more aggressive role of this light infantry against opponents that, at this point, in some of the darkest hours of the poorest, again, material condition uh, of medieval Europe would have been just as lightly kept and a sword which also tells something regarding the latter point chopping people to pieces um, because evidently that even the slider troops could could do that with some degree of again in individualism 
unitly. Um, and that can chop because the enemy is not that armored after all. Uh, and so, of course, there were equivalents even in the in other in, among the say the, the enemies of Constantinople. Uh, these troops we will we will document this in, in some other video better. But in this sense, don't let yourself be fooled just by okay we have this name in the Byzantine sources. These guys are issued with this particular um, equipment, um, but um, at the end of the day, this was happening pretty much everywhere because there are just not so many t different types of of troops that you can um, that you can field conceptually, right? And so, even though the Byzantines cared very much about this sort of preparation of the sort of uh, conceptualization of the type of troops they had and they, they were conceived for an orderly employment and some sort of pre pre um, thought literally um, uh, formation tactical commitment whatever etc um, the uh, just the way they were regularly used in the army uh, it's something that was going beyond whatever I don't know Leo the wise was was adding just next to the mere copy of the strategicon of a couple of centuries before, right? So um, there is a huge debate regarding, you know, what was even the strategicon, right? In which context was it written? Is what is written in it really what was going on on the field? Well, some things make a lot of sense. Um, I'm a great fan of the strategicon telling the truth because I think that that was really the peak of Byzantine civilization, and sort of military uh, synchrosis, right, of uh, Roman practicality and uh, Greek um, uh, geniality, right, blending together perfectly at that point in history. Uh, after that, it's a bit of a, a different story, right? The empire is much uh, more mutilated. It's, it's uh, mostly referring itself two models that didn't quite exist anymore and it becomes difficult for us to understand how much um, what we read is you know the, the reality of the time that is already by itself something complicated to do of just a sort of reactionary you know crystal crystallization to a quite change world you understand that because uh, the, the, the early medieval centuries for Constantinople had been really traumatic um, and it had paradoxically that ideology that had allowed to keep things together but uh, at some point they were just re-insisting on, on some things that had were, were not just part of the actual reality. I mean having a conversation with, a, with, a, with one of these guys you know, asking them you know, how they were framed, how they were regimented uh, how they were deployed, like where they came from but that would be amazing unfortunately we, we can't do that um, that's something you would like really to do with every uh, trooper in history about which we know so few after all which is by default like reality up to a few centuries ago so um, I find it always interesting to uh, try to objectivize as much as possible through comparative and diachronic understanding this kind of um, this kind of troops, this kind of models and how they work really and, and Byzantine history also passes through this. Like we, as I was saying before, just are struck by, I don't know, the Nikephorian cataphract or the, the Varangian guardsmen. But uh, we often forget that in order for these guys to be operative, and about the Varangian guard, I made a video explaining, I also made one about the Nikephorian cataphracts, but let's say the, uh, the, the, let's say the same Varangian army was actually more than the, elite, the ultra elite. Uh, you know, foot double-handed axemen, right? There were thousands of Scandinavians or people from from the Rus, etc., that settled within the Byzantine frontier initially, properly as Varangians, uh, Varangian uh, military, uh, just to become colonists of some sort. And just the the guard was tactically autonomous; they weren't just one type of trooper. And we tend to forget, in this sense, how many of these um, say uh, as always I would say like how the average trooper is always something 
say, less um, clamorous, less extraordinary, um, uh, impressive, scenographic, whatever, but um, it's, it's also the one that carries out some of the dirtiest tasks, right? The, the bloodiest, the, the, some of the least um, rewarding ones in warfare that, however, makes this thing work. I mean, how many trapezitae were needed to owl out even a, a, Nikefo a Nikephorian cataphract just to, to be fielded in the first place? Because you know that the, the Nikephorian cataphract, we were in the second half uh, talking about Nikephorus the second, I also made a video about him. Um, like they, the Byzantines literally decided that they had to have the, this this regiment of basically the heaviest type of cavalry that anybody could field ever. So they had the certainty that, of course, um, at least in that frontal attack, nobody could f could crush them. Of course, this was not an invincible force, uh, and it also was likely too expensive. Uh, this was created in a time which. Uh, Especially the Constantinopolis army had substantial resources as it was affirming itself also in the provincial ones that had become less reliable as we were observing before, also with the erosion of the same trapezitai type of social bases. Um, but um, of course th there was a balance, like you couldn't simply feel them, you had to prepare the battle for them and to uh, uh, send other troops in before after. The, usually the heaviest of course was, was in the uh, a reserve at the end of the battle, so for which, if you had managed to, to resist up to then, if you launch this last uh, force, right, and against uh, like the last remaining enemy, you had in theory the chance to to overwhelm them entirely. Except, of course, in order to field those cataphracts, you needed to have spent dramatically. Uh, uh, and a dramatic amount of logistical resources, etc. So that could have compromised even certain tactical and strategical situations. So it's always uh, about different ideas. See, Leo the Sixth, we even read him, especially I think in that video about Slavic warfare, which we read this strategical and then just observed how, of course, Leo, as I was saying before, just adds a little more to, to the same strategical word. Um, just. Uh, it's just a little um, extra info, and we have no reason even just to think that what was added there is something enormously meaningful, right? So there is always a lot to to look at and to to try to to, to appreciate, but uh, it's difficult. It's difficult, and one should study battles, etc., which we do rarely. But I must say, this is part of the cycle that I don't know has less battles as you know as content. But again, if one don't, does not get this background, sometimes it would miss the the consistency of these same armies. I mean, how can you understand Byzantine warfare if you don't realize, for example, this type of trapezite? Um, light cavalry was, um, you know, something more decently equipped and even more conceptually aggressive than the average sort of throwaway light horseman. Right? That, that tells you already something about the broader Byzantine military culture, which, if anything, makes you pose some, some questions that you may find somewhere else, etc. How, how could we evaluate this if we had not already looked at, I don't know, the, the Asiatic cavalry at that um, the Byzantines were facing and just observed uh, the, the differences in uh, panoply evolution between different peoples from the same steps across these centuries. Uh, that's how you have to study military history. There's really no other way. The rest is just, okay, I'll focus like other YouTube channels normally do on, on the big impactful thing Ah, the great battle told in 10 minutes. Um, so basically not telling it at all. Um, and um, and going with that, you know, what kind of depth, what kind of criticism, what kind of substantial, uh, what kind of concreteness um, you, you can't really find there. Like zero, right? Takes years, decades just to get somewhere um, decent in history, 
right? And consider that I do this even just as a side thing to my normal employment. So, and, and I'm constantly dissatisfied with the few things that I really know. So you can't imagine how at least I see the thing in terms of how I can deliver it to you, right? I also lengthen the videos like this because there is always something relevant to say, especially considering that, uh, you know, someone may stumble this videos randomly uh, just without background. So I, I, uh, that, that always does something and it's always a way to say prepare to my content um, to some extent. And uh, what can you say? This is it, right? I know that historical military unit series sometimes can, especially for this lighter troops, can be really bad. Uh, is it all we know? Well, technically, yes. These are just, again, units will read the name somewhere because in a treaty, again, and especially in the Byzantine mentality, they were conceptualized as such and they were ideally provided with this equipment and then zero. Like, we literally know nothing about this. Right, we can have more or less sort of iconographic, archaeological evidence that can tell us, well, yeah, this kind of equipment existed here and there, but in concretely, right, quantitatively and qualitatively, absolutely and relatively, we know and so the most important thing you should know, we know practically nothing. That's where they remain. And so it's up to the historian at that point especially the one that has more experience of, of different stuff at a time, which is increasingly difficult to find if it ever existed about these topics, um, you know, to widen the picture, like the, the horizon, uh, to say, well, let's see this a bit in perspective, see it from different sides, and see if there is some sort of concept to compare in it with I don't know, the enemies the Empire was fighting against, or the, you know, the, the type of units that had existed before, why they had changed at this time, why this term was used, um, where it could have come from, uh, just for whichever uh, etymological or administrative or practical reason we don't understand. Thinking always of the unthinkable, like, well, say, there may be different reasons why these things happen. Of course, they have to make sense, right? Um, it's not just by making guesses that, like, the first thing that comes into your mind. It has to make sense with something that you already know. Otherwise, it's it's really, it's really nothing. Um, I often get these questions. Like, well, couldn't it be that this is this because of this way? And you realize that it's just, again, to have fun with the guess rather than actually guessing anything. Um on a on an actual basis, right? So you can't always be challenging and it's difficult especially to orient yourself in these topics if you've never heard that of, of them before in this dimensions. But getting to the actual source and um hearing some scholarly guess or some note, etc. It can be sometimes the scholarly guess uh, I'm always critical, right? I hardly uh, agree with uh, you know anything you read at this point. So the, the sources as always are um, the primary ones are are the thing you sh should always consider uh, the most, right? And, and always remember this: that military history is counterintuitive. You don't really have uh, that easy pattern where you can easily find so many backs and forths. I mean, armies do not change from a day to another in a radical way never right the 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 story that a reformer arrived one day and everything changed it's complete it, it it's never happened historically right all the great reform military reforms in history were basically just guys who were pretty good with the armies that existed at the time and so that they, they reinforced the military system that but that had however already come to be the one it was right um you can't quite even control a certain point in history what kind of, even what armies are what are becoming I mean, ask Constantinople when the problem the, the rebellious province were says were trying to challenge uh, the same system in a way uh, or at least this the centrality of Constantinople and we talked Byzantine 
I would talk the, the Empire, but then w what was that exactly and how did it work? And that's that's the problem. All right. And um, yeah, this is pretty much it. Uh, I don't think there is anything to add to some detail we read, but you understand it. It's, it's all pretty simple. It's all pretty logical as well. There isn't much, even in terms of the shield shape, right? It's the classical sort of lighter but wider shield for some degree of distance fighting, but also in this case, perhaps something more dynamic, but still with that level of uh, material availability is low in early medieval times. However, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.